the monetarists, who were the opponents of, of Keynesian e economists in the 60s and 70s, and who are called what are called new classical economists today, who are kind of the successors of the monetarists, uh, argue that a larger deficit is not going to boost real GDP. Um, they're very skeptical of models in which you have persistent sticky price effects, that is the price level failing to clear the market and the wage rate failing to clear the labor market. But in terms of what fiscal policy can do, the argument is that government spending is going to displace private spending rather than uh, in increase the total. So why would that be true if government's borrowing the money? Well, if they're borrowing it from domestic credit markets and that raises interest rates, then that crowds out private investment. That was kind of the traditional argument. Uh, a newer argument, sometimes called Ricardian equivalence, is that if you take consumers to be sort of serious planners of their futures, people seriously plan their future consumption stream, and people do save for retirement, so they do some of this at least, then when they see a bigger deficit, they realize that future taxes are going to have to be higher. Even if the debt's never repaid, it still has to be serviced. So that implies a stream of taxes to make the interest payments. And if that's true, then I need to save more to have the same consumption in the future because I need to save enough to pay my higher future tax bill. How much do I need to save? Well, I need to save exactly the interest that's due on the Treasury bond, which means I save by buying the Treasury bond. So if all the Treasury bond sales come out of uh, what would have been private consumption but now is private savings, then there's no stimulus to spending. The offset in private consumption spending exactly matches the increase in government spending. So it's a mix of spending in the economy that changes and not the total. And so whether it's going to stimulate output in the long run depends on whether the government spending passes a cost-benefit test, but in the short run, don't expect to see anything. So here's Robert Barrow, who's sort of the father of Ricardian equivalence, uh, making this argument. And he makes it in an interesting way. He says, look, the unemployed resources that are being counted upon to increase, uh, increase output are not as idle as uh, the Keynesian model assumes. People are actually looking for a job. Owners of resources of, of machines are trying to find good matches for them where they can uh, rent them out. So it's a question of where those resources ought to be put back to work. And if you hire them for some kind of public works project, you're diverting them from the search process that would land them somewhere else. But that search process is itself productive. Uh, so you're not, they're not idle in a, in, a, in a fundamental sense. They're actually doing something productive that uh, it's costly to interrupt. Next. Uh, just one last point I want to make is, and the Ricardian equivalence argument doesn't really get to this, but I think it's an important point. And I think it may help explain why there's so much investable money, so much, so many billions in retained earnings just sitting on the sidelines now. One reason businesses aren't borrowing much from banks is that they've got lots of retained earnings that more than they want to invest in the current environment. One reason the current environment is not hospitable is that we have these huge uh, future tax payments to cover the deficits we ran in the last few years, but we don't know what those taxes are going to be. Uh, if you Impose the taxes in the present, at least you'd know what they were and you could adjust to them. But in the future, we don't know whether they're going to be higher income taxes, higher payroll taxes, higher excise taxes, higher money printing by the Fed to pay the government's bills. That's a tax on currency. Uh, when these taxes are going to arrive. So in an economy with a, with a larger government debt, uh, there's more uncertainty about what taxes are going to be in the future. And this is consistent with uh, the finding of some uh, economists, uh, Ken Rogoff uh, and 
Carmen Rodriguez in, in particular. No, not Rodriguez. Reinhardt, thank you. Uh, that economies with have heavier debt have slower growth. And they have slower growth because they have less investment. And so debt financing is, in that sense, certainly not costless. <laughs>